One of the great advantages of being at a church for 24 years is that the church's mission statement and the pastor's mission statement merge. And uh, my life's mission is to spread a passion for the supremacy of God in all things, for the joy of all peoples through Jesus Christ. And therefore, my goal with you is to spread a passion for God's supremacy in your life. So let me just take that apart for a moment. I am here with you in these sessions so that because of what I say, because of the way I pray, because of the way I am and all that happens here, your passion for Christ would skyrocket. I know that teenagers have brains and they think. I know that teenagers have hearts so they feel. And I'm not here just to change the way you think, though that's big. I hope to do that. But because of the way you think, the way you feel becomes different. We call it a passion for the supremacy of God. Not just anything about God, but that he's big, he's majestic, he's glorious. He's the greatest thing in the universe and the greatest thing in your life. So a passion for the supremacy of God in all things, your leisure time, what you do with the internet, what you do in sports, what you do with your clothes, what you do with mom and dad, what you do in private when nobody's watching, what you do in your part-time job, what you do at school, in all things, he's supreme. I want that to happen because of what we do here together. For the joy of all peoples, if great joy landed on this group this weekend and it stopped here and it didn't spill over for anybody else, any people or peoples, any neighbors, any school friends, we would have failed. And in fact, that joy would dry up in a minute like the Jordan River running into the Dead Sea, which has no outlets. It becomes salt and all the fish die. That's the way your life would be if joy landed on you and didn't go anywhere else. So our mission statement is a passion for the supremacy of God in all things for other people's joy because your joy is maximized when it spills over to other people. Last phrase, through Jesus Christ. And the reason that has to be there is for two things, two reasons. One, in Jesus Christ is where you see God's supremacy most clearly. God is invisible. Jesus is written all over the pages of the New Testament. You can watch Jesus act on earth in human skin, and therefore Jesus is the place we see the supremacy of God, the glory of God, the magnificence of God, and therefore all of this seeing of his supremacy is through Jesus and the second reason is, every single person in this room is a sinner. We have absolutely no rights to see God or enjoy God or each other or anything else. And our only hope is that Jesus died in our place and that he rose again and that because he has paid our debt and has become our righteousness, therefore, we have the possibility of enjoying a passion in his supremacy. So that's my goal. That's my goal in every sermon I preach. And therefore, that's my goal in our time together. So that's where we're going. Let me begin tonight's session on God's passion for his glory with some autobiography. Um, A little bit of talk about my desire to be happy as a teenager and how God took some very unusual steps to drive it deep. And, and then secondly, my reverence for the glory of God as a teenager and how God took some unusual steps to make that intense. When I was your age, um, let's just say, let's start at 14. I had a very severe case of acne, pimples, zits. None of you come close. 
In fact, it's amazing to me how few teenagers have what I had. None of you come close. And uh, it had a a pretty significant effect on me. It was so bad that my mother and father sent me to a dermatologist. That's a skin doctor. He would burn my face with a lamp. He would rub dry ice all over it and sizzle it. And then he would go poking at it with his little, little fine needles. And it hurt so bad, tears would run down my face. And then he would send me out to my car to drive home in front of human beings. And I looked like a truck had hit me. I, was, I mean, it was bad enough to have the problem. It, it was to have, to have been treated like that and then to be sent home. I just wanted to get home really fast and bury my face in the pillow and hope that the next day it didn't look so bad. The effect that had on me was not to make me desire less to be happy, but it just took me off the fast track. Nobody, at least I didn't think anybody would really want to be around me, and therefore I didn't get into any party scene. I just avoided people by and large. I, I, I did my studies well. I think God was in the business of making me deeply longed to be happy in ways that I could not find because he had cut me off from where a lot of my friends were finding it, and I thank him with all of my heart. The second thing that he did was that, you may have heard this, I've told it many times, it's all written up in the anxiety chapter in Future Grace. If you ever see that big fat book in your parents' house sometime, read the chapter on anxiety. It'll tell you all about my struggles. But in a nutshell was, I could not speak in front of a group starting in about the seventh grade. And you think you got a problem with shaky knees or nervous hands or fluttery. Some of you, I've never seen anybody with my problem except maybe one person in, in school with my son Benjamin at Calvin Christian School. But... I couldn't. I mean, I couldn't. If you put me up in front of a class to give a 15-minute report or a 15-second report, it's not that I shook and was embarrassed. It's that my shoulders and my throat simply closed off. It could not be done. So I went to Mr. Vermillion, my teacher in the 10th grade, and I said, Mr. Vermillion, I know that part of the requirement in this class is to give an oral book report. I cannot do it. And he says, well, Johnny, you have to in order to make a B. And I said, well, I'll just take a C then. And I took a C in that class because I just said, I cannot give an oral book report. So I I avoided all class offices. You know, if you're going to run for vice president or president or or secretary, you've got to give a little speech in front of the class. No way was I ever going to give a speech in front of the class. So that that took me off the track of the official, you know, be somebody in, in campus thing. And then thirdly, I was a, this may be complimenting myself, a C-plus athlete. C-plus. I was in a big high school, which means I couldn't make any team. But I love basketball. I love football. I love track. I love to swim. And I couldn't compete with any of the, the guys. And so I just did it in my backyard. And, you know, all you guys are wimps. I've never seen, I've never seen at a retreat Tackle football. I mean, I'd never heard of flag football until I went to college. We only played tackle football with no pads. Billy Shaughnessy broke his neck in my backyard. (laughs) Didn't get paralyzed. Just had to wear one of these things for, you know, six or eight weeks. We really played football, but but I couldn't. I was just, you know, it was a C plus. I loved to play, but I, I was no good. I just loved to play. So for those three reasons, at least, I look back on a lot of sadness, a lot of sadness. And to this day, I do not begrudge the school of suffering that God walked me through. Not big suffering, just little suffering, like you all know what I'm talking about. And I just thank him for it. I just thank him for it. I think he was making a preacher. You want to find out the story about how that standing in front of a group thing turned around? Well... You can read the chapter in Future Grace. What about the uh, reverence for the glory of God? My father revered God. He was an evangelist. He traveled. He was away from home probably two-thirds of every year. 
Come home for four days, be gone for three weeks. Come home for four days, be gone for two weeks. Come home for four days, be gone for four weeks. He was an evangelist. And he preached. He'd fly across the country. And in those days, to fly on a little puddle jumper plane across the country, not a big jet that had to stop three times before it got to California from South Carolina, you, could, you had to go for six weeks. You couldn't just go and come back in a day. And so he would be gone a long time. And I loved my dad. And I still to this day, my mother's in heaven, but I love my dad. And I stood in awe of him. I never resented that my dad was away from home so much because my mother loved what he was doing. I loved what he was doing. And when he came home and we sat down together at the dinner table and he told some fresh new jokes and told some triumphs of the gospel, I thought I had the greatest dad in the world. And I stood in awe of my dad's reverence for God. When my dad prayed, I trembled almost. And what he seemed to refer to over and over again was the glory of God. So I revered my father. That was a huge impact. And then there was this book. It says Johnny S. Piper on the front of it. My parents gave me this January 11, 1961. Anybody know how old I was in 1961? Want to make a stab at it? I mean, it's going to be teens, right? 15. I'm 58. January 11, 1961. Happy birthday, son. This book will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from this book. If I smell this book like this, I can picture my twin bed. I can picture the wallpaper. I can picture the color of the lamp. I can see my pajamas. I can feel the little satin edge to the blanket that I held on to as I went to sleep. I love this book. And when I go back and I look what's underlined in this book, 15, 16, 17, I switched Bibles when I was 18. This is a King James. I don't use King James anymore. When I, when I look at what I underlined for those three years, I said to John Erickson before we came out here, he was saying, now teenagers have a lot of distractions and their hearts are going a lot of different areas. And I, I put this Bible out in front and I said, and teenagers can have some mighty deep experiences with God. Because I remember late nights with this book. And I cherish what God did in showing himself to me. And I, I was walking through looking and I noticed a couple of key texts like these two were underlined. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. My mother and father wrote me that over and over again when I left home and went off to college. And another one was, Therefore he has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. If you put the beginning and the end of that together, God raised him up to God's glory, and, and it was starting to formulate in my mind God is really serious about His glory. God is really serious about His glory. He's not just saying, you be serious about my glory. God is really serious about His glory. So, what I want to do for the next few minutes is give you some illustrations from the Bible of how serious God is about His glory. I've, I've called it God's passion for His glory. And what I want to leave you with tonight is the strong impression God really loves His glory. God has a burning zeal for His glory to be known and exalted and honored and loved and reverenced. God is radically God-centered the heart that is most serious and most passionate about the glory of God is God's heart. And that's what I want you to go away feeling tonight. And I need to show you some passages of Scripture to help you feel that. That's not just my idea. That's God's Word. But let's, let's move from general revelation, the sky, the tornado, the thunder, the storms, to special revelation, the Bible. Scientists know that light travels five 
8.87 trillion miles per year. What's that called? A light year. They also know, with a pretty fair degree of certainty, that our galaxy, the Milky Way, is about 100,000 light years across. So that's 587,000 trillion miles across. A trillion is a million with three more zeros and then three more zeros. That's how wide our galaxy is. And the Hubble telescope is out there sending back, I don't know whether it's still functioning or not, but a few years ago it was when I was thinking about these things. So of my latest reckoning, there are about a million such galaxies as the Milky Way, which is 587,000 trillion miles across. And there are about a million of these galaxies that we can see with the most powerful telescope. And beyond that, no one knows but God. And in our little, little galaxy, it's one of the smaller ones, there are about 100 million stars, of which our sun is a, a modest one burning on the cooler edge at about 6,000 degrees centigrade and traveling at about 155 miles per second in its orbit through the galaxy called the Milky Way so that it will complete its first orbit in 200 million years. Now, scientists know these things, and therefore they have a certain reverence for the universe. They stand in awe of what they see. And they hear a Christian like me saying, God created that with his little finger or with the word of his mouth, and he put man, human beings, in one place, planet Earth. Little teeny weeny planet Earth. And they laugh and say, with their skeptical attitude, seems like a lot of wasted space. What's the point of that? Look at all the space. And man occupies this little teeny planet? What's that about? And I say, well, it would be wasted space if it were about us. But Psalm 19, 1 says, the heavens are not talking about us. When you look up at the stars, ever been to a place where there are no city lights, no smog, totally dark, and suddenly you realize what's up there? Where I live in Minneapolis, I can count the stars. But maybe where you live, further out, I don't know, turn off all the lights, you couldn't begin to count the stars. It's a sheet of light on a mountain in Utah. And when you look at that, the Bible says, Psalm 19.1, it's not about you. The heavens are telling the glory of God. The fact that it, there is so much space out there, all watching down on us little humans, is to tell us we are insignificant. What this is about really is significant, namely the glory of God. And who made it to do that? God made it to do that. God decided that the universe would talk about God. So that's my first argument my first illustration, God is radically God-exalting. He designed for the universe to be about himself. Here's a second illustration of the same point. The cross of Christ is right at the center of history. We all know John, know Romans 
3.23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Come short of the glory of God. Sin is all about being defined in relationship to the glory of God. If we don't love the glory of God the way we should, we're sinning. If we don't reverence it the way we should, we're sinning. Sin is a falling short of the glory of God. As hard as we try, we, we will always fall short. And so I think that means that everyone here on earth is sinful, that um, we all fall short, like none of us um, can be that great. No matter how hard we try, how good we are, how sinless we sh like think we are, we're going to fall short. I think it has a lot to do with the way we break our relationship with God sometimes. Every man, every woman, child, everybody who's born a human has fallen short of His glory, which is perfection, I guess. Everybody's not perfect. So what can be done about it? Answer the cross. Jesus Christ came into the world to do two things. There's a curse upon us, and you may feel that tonight. I feel like I'm cursed, and you are cursed. And there is a curse upon all who have sinned. Galatians 3.13, Christ became a curse for us. As it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So a curse was on us. Christ came into the world, bears the wrath, the curse of God, and lifts it from us. This is the gospel. This is the way you become a Christian, by seeing Jesus Christ lifting the curse from you in taking your place. And secondly, he lived an absolutely perfect life, which is what you were required to do, and you couldn't do it, I couldn't do it, and Christ did it on our behalf. So he bears our curse and he provides our righteousness so that tonight you can lay your head down on the pillow in absolute peace. All my sins are covered and the curse is gone. All my righteousness is provided if, as I leave this place, I cast myself upon Jesus Christ as my Savior and my Lord. But here's the catcher. God had a view to His glory when He put His Son on the cross for us. Romans chapter 3, verse 25, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in His blood through faith. This was to demonstrate His righteousness because in the forbearance of God, He passed over sins previously committed. This was to demonstrate the righteousness of God. Christ was put forward to show that the glory of God's righteousness is not compromised in forgiving you by simply taking away your sin because of faith. And he said he did it because he had passed over former sins. For example, you remember David and Bathsheba? When he should have been in the war, he was on the housetop, he looks down, she's taking a bath, he gets really turned on, brings her over, he's the king, he can do anything he wants, he gets her pregnant, and now he's got a problem, she's married, Uriah, a valiant soldier, is on the field, thinks through, okay, I'll solve this problem, I'll get Uriah home, I'll get him down uh, sleeping with his wife, they'll think it's his baby. And he won't sleep with his wife because he's such a noble soldier and he couldn't imagine having that kind of pleasure while all of his comrades are out risking their lives for the kingdom, which is what David should have been doing. So David tries to get him drunk and that doesn't work. And so he kills him. He does it indirectly by telling Joab, just make sure he gets up close so they shoot him and and the word comes back and says, whew, and then he takes her and makes her his wife, and now it's baby is, whew, the baby looks okay. And God comes to Nathan, the prophet, and says, I have a message for David. You go tell him a little parable about a man who had many sheep and a man who had one sheep, and the man who had many sheep went to the man who had one sheep and stole the sheep so he could cook it and give it to his friends. 
and see what David says about that man. So he tells him the parable, and David says, oh, let's get that man. And Nathan, this is an unbelievably courageous prophet, says, you're the man. You're the man. And David, out of his mouth comes repentance. And out of Nathan's mouth, from God comes, the Lord has taken away your sin. Okay. Picture yourself as Uriah's dad. To which I would respond by saying, no way! You're just going to, you're just going to say, you're forgiven. He killed my son, raped my daughter-in-law, and you're just going to say, your sins are forgiven. Any judge in Hennepin County Courthouse who says to a rapist and a murderer, you can go, you promise not to do it again, I forgive you, would be off the bench in a minute. It would be called a travesty of justice, and that's what God does for you every day. And therefore, God is radically unjust. It's called an abomination in the book of Proverbs to justify the ungodly. Now, do you see the problem God had in justifying sinners like us? I mean, hardly anybody in America wrestles with this problem. The only problem America wrestles with is that God is mean to us when bad things happen. Not that God is gracious to us and is unjust in forgiving us. So what does God do? to solve the problem of the glory of his justice being compromised in the forgiveness of sinners? He kills his son. He puts his son in our place so that all the universe would see God takes sin seriously. God exalts his glory. When David tramples his glory in the dirt, and God comes along and says, I forgive you. You may still be king. All the universe cries out, no, until they see a thousand years later, God saying, this is how seriously I take my forgiveness of David. I slay my son in his place. That's what I do about sin. That's what I do to vindicate my glory. And so even at the center of history here with the cross, God is passionate for His glory. 